So we're very honored to have Ben Bernanke as our special guest. And uh, while I don't think he really needs an introduction, I think he deserves an introduction. So let me give him an appropriate introduction. Um, obviously, he served as the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board uh, from 2006 to 2014. He was the 14th chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And before that, he had a distinguished career in academic life and also in public service. So let me take you back to the beginning. He is a native of Dillon, South Carolina. And how many people know where Dillon, South Carolina is? OK. So you all know that's where south of the border uh, is. There, and any of you ever driven down? Um, well, if you drove down there in the uh, 1970s, your waiter during the summers might have been Ben Bernanke, because he worked there as a waiter. Um, and uh, he actually had a precocious career uh, growing up there. He was uh, so talented in the first grade that after just two weeks in the first grade, they skipped into second grade. That's pretty impressive. He was the spelling bee champion of South Carolina and came to Washington, I think at the age of 13, to compete in the national spelling bee, but he didn't win because he misspelled the word Edelweiss, and that's because the sound of music had never played in Dillon, South Carolina. <laughs> In high school, he was valedictorian of his class, not surprisingly, and had the highest SAT score in the entire state. Um, got a, a scholarship to Harvard, went to Harvard, graduated summa cum laude in economics, not surprisingly, in 1975. In 1979, he got his PhD at MIT. Uh, from that point, he went to teach from 1979 to 1985 at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford and taught economics. And then he was lured back to the East Coast by Princeton University, which made him a tenured faculty member at the age of 31. And he taught at Princeton Economics Department for many years and became, from 1998 to 2002, the chairman of that department. Uh, and then he got a call from Glenn Hubbard asking whether he'd be interested in perhaps government service. He was uh, recruited to serve on the Federal Reserve Board, served for several years on the Federal Reserve Board, and then uh, was recruited to serve as the, as the uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Bush. And from that position, he then became chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, he is interested in many other things other than economics. One of them is baseball. He's a devoted, was originally a devoted Los Angeles Dodgers fan, then became a devoted Boston Red Sox fan, as now is a devoted, very committed Washington Nationals <laughs> fan. Um, And I should say he's also a distinguished author. He's written, written many great books on economics. Uh, his specialty was the Great Depression. Uh, he later became, obviously, a specialist in the Great Recession. We'll talk about that as well. But I would like to recommend this book that he's written and I've read, uh, and it's quite good, The Courage to Act, which he actually wrote himself. Uh, everybody who writes a book these days doesn't write it himself, but he did. And I highly recommend it if you want to get a picture of what happened during those days, the Great Recession. So. Uh, let's start, and thank you very much for coming. That was an unbelievable recitation in my CV. Uh, it was pretty, pretty accurate, I don't know. Yeah, uh, so, yeah exactly. So um, one day you wake up and you're the most powerful man in the financial world, and the next day you're driving your car to Brookings. So do you really miss the power that you had at those days when you were running the Fed and running the financial world? No, not, not at all, because the power... <laughs> There's the power over here and the responsibility over here, you know. I like now I can get the newspaper in the morning, you know, and look at the story and say, gee, that's a significant problem. Somebody ought to do something about that. <laughs> you know? Well, in thinking about that, did you ever say, well, geez, maybe yeah. I'll just send an email to Janet Yellen and say, here's some advice, or you stay out of that? No, I wouldn't do that. Um, did any of your predecessors ever call you with advice? Uh, no, no. Um, I mean, I met occasionally with, uh, with Alan and with Paul, um, more as a courtesy than anything else. The only advice I got from Alan Greenspan was the last day before he left, we had breakfast together in his private dining room up by the cafeteria in, in, at the Fed. And he told me, he said, the one thing I would tell you, he says, always sit at the table so you can see the clock. Because then you know when the meeting's over and you can get to your next, okay. your next meeting. So that was, that was pretty much all the advice all right, I got. Well, that's good. <laughs> well, that was pretty good advice. Yeah. So um, I do want to get into the Great Recession and so forth, but I feel um, you have such an interesting background. I just would like to go through some of the things I mentioned. What was it like growing up in Dillon, South Carolina? You're, you know, it's not a big metropolis. Um, you were a very modest-sized Jewish uh, community there. Mm -hmm. So what was it like, and, and uh, did you actually, actually serve uh, dinners and so forth at, uh, at the south of the border? Well, sure. So my, um, 
uh, my family had been there since 1941 when my grandfather moved and bought a drugstore there. And my father and uncle were the town pharmacists. They were known as Dr. Morton, Dr. Phil, because there was only like one doctor in the entire town. And so people would come to them and ask them for you know, medical advice of various kinds. And um, it was a small Jewish community. There were, you know, we had, um, I don't know, about 50 people and within 20 mile, 20 mile uh, radius. So it was, it was, in some ways, it was like being a fish out of water, in some ways, and that made me want to look at the bigger world. But in other ways, it was actually a very interesting formative experience because, you know, it's, it's not a rich area. A lot of people work really hard. Um, I worked construction. I waited tables. I did wait on tables at uh, south of the border. Uh, I was even Pedro. Uh, Pedro was the, uh, right. the mascot. Right. And you can tell by my coloring in my beard, you know, I actually had the right, the right look. So I did that a couple so, of times. Who were the best tippers in those days? The best tippers were uh, uh, the guys from, uh, so, so, so south of the border, it's south of the North Carolina, South Carolina border. It's halfway between New York and Miami. And so you had the snowbirds coming down, you know, driving down. And it was a two-day drive in those days. People didn't fly. And they would stop and stay overnight south of the border. So these guys, you know, who, you know, New Jersey, New York, those were the best tippers. Southerners are wonderful, hospitable people, but they are lousy tippers. tippers. Okay. Yeah. So I guess the private equity people, they were good tippers, right? <laughs> well, they didn't identify themselves at the right. time. Right. Did they have private equity? Uh, no. <laughs> no. So, um, okay, so you, you do extremely well. And I want to make sure I got the facts right. On Edelweiss, did you yes. never have heard of the word, I assume, no, when you were asked? No, I did not. I and so you were, but you were the spelling bee champion of South Carolina. I was indeed. I was indeed. And I was very disappointed at losing the, the, the national finals was in the Mayflower Hotel, not too right. far from here. And I missed that word. And um, I was very disappointed because the winner got to be uh, in the Ed Sullivan audience and acknowledged from wow. the stage by Ed Sullivan. Um, so that was but like... whoever won probably didn't wind up becoming chairman of the Federal Reserve. No. Like that. <laughs> Spelling is not the major right, qualification. Right. Okay. All right. so, um, so when you went down, you were in high school, you got a 1590 out of 1600 on your SATs, the highest in the state. So you missed uh, one question. Huh? Missed one. Would you ever I, wonder what I, it was? I have no, no idea. So um, did you practice? Like today, a lot of people um, have these tutors and so forth. Did you have a lot of tutoring? None whatsoever. No. no, I didn't even know what was going on. It was like, what are we doing tomorrow? You know, we're going to go over to take this test. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. So, I'm, I'm um, good at taking tests, actually, but not everything in the, in the world, but some things I can do. So it turns out, uh, as you can reveal in your book, that you, going to Harvard was not something that was on your mind, but mm -hmm. an African-American who was, had befriended you, who had gone to Harvard, mm -hmm. really persuaded you. And I, I point that out because, um, you know, it wasn't actually the case that, let's say, a lot of African-Americans were uh, mixing with white Jewish families no. in those days, but no. how did this friend become so close to you? Well, his name is uh, Ken Manning, and he's now a professor at MIT, and uh, his family uh, knew our family through the drugstore where they, where they traded. And um, Ken was and is a very brilliant, precocious man, and he had gone several years earlier to some kind of program, uh, which got him eventually into Harvard, and then he went to Harvard Graduate School, and now he's an MIT professor, as I said. And he took it on himself, you know, to persuade my parents that I should go to Harvard. And I was, at the time, you know, had no idea of how that might happen. And he, he sort of pressed it and convinced everybody. And So you applied and you got in? Yeah. Did you apply anywhere else, or? Yeah, no, I applied a lot of places, yeah. I, I did okay. I got in everywhere, of course. I did okay, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. so your, the story is that your mother was afraid you might lose your Jewish identity if you mm -hmm. went to Harvard. Didn't she know everybody at Harvard is Jewish, or she didn't know that? <laughs> I don't know, maybe it wasn't quite as true in 1971. Not as, not I'm, not, okay. I'm right. not sure. All right, so. She was, actually, she was most afraid that I didn't have the right clothes. Oh. So she had this image of like 1950s Harvard, you know, where right. people have little beanies and, you know, they're all dressed up and they have valets and everything. You know, but of course, in the 70s at Harvard, everybody was wearing blue jeans right. and smoking dope and all kind of stuff. And, uh, anyway, so if she'd known that, I wouldn't have gone at all, probably. But. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you get to Harvard, and mm -hmm. you're a lot of keep kids from fancy prep schools and so forth. So were you intimidated or not really? Sure, sure I was. Um, and I didn't do that well at the beginning because I had never, you know, never learned how to study. Never, you know, I was way behind in all my classes and everything. So, so it took a while. So you graduated summa cum laude, so you must have turned things around. I did, I did um, turn it around. <laughs> I found economics, actually. Um, I, one of my problems was I had no idea what I wanted to study. Everything looked interesting to me, so I would be taking all kinds of things all over the place. And then um, I took some economics courses. Actually, the professor in my 
uh, econ course was Marty Feldstein, who is still right. you know, a prominent economist. Um, and uh, what I liked about it was that it was sort of a combination of humanities, you know, and how people live and how to help people and so on. On the one hand, on the other side, of course, it was quantitative. And, and so I took it, I thought of it as a compromise between all the other things I was interested in, but I, I really enjoyed it. All right, it worked out uh, okay. Worked out okay, And I so um, then you had the choice, do you go to get your PhD at Harvard or MIT? And MIT was the place you chose. How come you chose to go to MIT? Well, Dale Jorgensen, who was my senior thesis advisor at Harvard, you know, said, go, go to MIT, it's the best place. MIT is very interesting because, you know, we wouldn't expect to see a, a top economics department in an engineering school. But Paul Samuelson, the famous economist, um, had come there as a young man, and he had brought others there. And, and at the time, when I was there, it was really a, a, a hothouse of talent. And um, learned a lot from, you know, you were just describing um, your, your acquaintance, Ken Rogoff, who was right. a professor at Harvard and was the second ranked chess champion in the world or something at the time. Um, he was my, my office mate at MIT right. and just sort of, a, that was sort of the kind of people that we were So you never played him with. in chess though, right? I did play him once. Um, he, he is, Ken, this, we're really off topic here, David, but uh, <laughs> Ken, <laughs> Ken is, uh, at one time had the record for simultaneous blindfolded chess games, 16 simultaneous blindfolded chess games. So in a party we had at our house, we decided, you know, with five, six people here, you know, let, let him, you know. So he would sit in the kitchen and call out, you know, we would all be out in the other room, you know, moving around. Right. And I was the last guy to, to, to fall, but I, I, at the time I felt it was like being rolled over by a steamroller. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So he's, he was a terrific chess player, he knew Bobby Fischer, uh, but he decided to be an economist, and I think he probably made okay. a good career choice, actually. A higher calling. So, yeah. um, so you, you got your PhD at MIT, and then why did you decide to go to the West Coast, the Stanford? Well, because a lot of exciting things were happening out there, you know, a lot of interesting people, and it didn't hurt that uh, they were offering a lot more money. That wasn't, that wasn't okay. a bad thing okay. either. You know about, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was, um, it was actually a really good place to go because there was a lot of, interesting work going on uh, that was useful to me in thinking about the issues of credit and finance that, that I wanted to study. So mm -hmm. I should have said that uh, while you were at MIT, you met uh, your wife on a blind date, mm -hmm. and you proposed there just two months later? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's unusual. So you're is it? I don't know. Two I months is a long time. <laughs> I, I waited about seven years, but, uh, but anyway. No, I'm a decisive guy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Um, it's, you're at Stanford, you have an opportunity to be a tenured professor there at the age of 31. You get an offer to go back to Princeton. Um, why did you decide to move back east? Tough call, a lot of good people. Uh, there were some, Princeton was a very good department, but you know, um, we'd been at Stanford, California for six years. My wife, we had young kids. My wife said Princeton would be a great place to raise kids, which it was. And so we ended up going back there, but don't regret it. I liked, I liked both places quite a bit, still visit them both. And you say in your book that you ultimately became the chairman of the economics department, and your big decision was whether you have donuts or um, bagels at the uh, mm -hmm. economic that was very conference meetings. Yes. Yeah. So, um, how did you decide to specialize in the Great Depression uh, as an area of expertise? Well, it actually uh, probably goes back to um, in graduate school. Uh, you didn't mention Stan Fisher, who uh, All right. you're going to get to Stanley. All right. Uh, he was my thesis advisor, PhD advisor in, at MIT. He now, people probably know, he's now the, the vice chairman of the Fed, and he was previously also the central bank governor in Israel. Um, but I went to see him and I asked him, you know, should I, should I take up macroeconomics and monetary economics? And he said, um, he gave me a copy, an 800-page book of Friedman and Schwartz's famous monetary history of the United States, and he said, take this book, and uh, if you can get through it without falling asleep, you should take this, you know, you should, be, you should be a monetary economist. Then I read the book, and it was about the history of monetary policy and monetary economics in the United States going back to the Civil War, and including a lot of interesting, you know, stuff on the Great Depression. And I, I just was so fascinated by it. And it, the thing about monetary economics is that this is, this is stuff that really matters. It really affects people's lives in really palpable ways. And the Great Depression just being one example where monetary policy and other issues related to the gold standard and the like helped drive the country and the world into a 12-year okay. depression, which in turn led to World War II and so on. So it was very exciting to me. And uh, the depression was a great puzzle, trying to understand how that could happen. Um, 
And so I majored in these things and, and began to write about history. And I, I must say that um, one of the great lessons I learned was that you know, uh, the world is complicated and history is a very important lens to look at you know, what's going on. Okay, so you rise up, you're at Princeton, you're doing well, you're an expert in, in the Depression, and probably the, greatest, uh, country, the, the nation's greatest expert in the Great Depression. Um, and then you get a call from Glenn Hubbard, who I think was then the head of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Bush, 43, mm -hmm. says, would you like to go into public service? And, and how did it uh, come about that you got a meeting with President Bush, and how was your meeting with President Bush? Well, um, they were trying to fill a spot on the Board of Governors. People probably know that the board has seven people who are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and the chairman is one member of that seven-person board. And uh, they had uh, a two-year spot, basically, there. And the question was, would I be willing to consider being on the Fed board? Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, I've been studying monetary policy my whole career. Maybe here's a chance to, to do okay. something with it. Um, and so uh, I said I would, I would interview, and so I went down to um, Washington. I talked to Josh Bolton, the President Bush's uh, uh, advisor, who is actually I saw here today. Um, but then I went to talk to the President, and um, at one point he asked me a bunch of questions Did about- Did he ask you any questions that stumped you on the- No, event? no, he didn't ask me, but eventually after we got through, after we got through the sort of simple questions about inflation and so on, he said, um, so do you have any political experience? And I said, well, sir, it won't count for much in this office, but I have served two terms as an elected member of the Montgomery Township, New Jersey Board of Education. And he said, well, that counts for a lot. That's very important work. And uh, that was it. That sealed the deal. Uh, and uh, so he appointed me. And I, you know, I, I explained to my wife that this is only going to be a temporary thing. A couple of years, I'd come back. And we kept our home in New Jersey. And I would drive home every weekend. And um, I, I began, I had an opportunity to be on the board and to work with Alan Greenspan and the people okay. who were there at the time. So you're doing that, and then all of a sudden you get a call and say, would you like to be the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors? I guess mm -hmm. Glenn Hubbard was leaving, and uh, mm -hmm. did you have any second thoughts about that? No, see, the, the, the chairman of economic, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, which by the way, happened this week, we're, we're gonna have an event at Brookings, uh, you know, commemorating the 70th anniversary of that, of that institution, it's like an internal consulting firm inside the White House, and, it, and it, what it does is it provides the president and the, and the executive branch with, with guidance on a whole variety of different issues related to economics. And it's a great job. It's just a really interesting job to be the chairman of that. You get involved in all the policy discussions. Um, so I was delighted to have that. I mean, this was, the, as far as I'm concerned, this was one of the best jobs in Washington for an economist. And uh, so I expressed interest, and I told Princeton, you know, Three years, not two, but I promised to be back, and I went over and I and I and I was the okay. council chairman for a while. So when you were doing that, you're meeting with the president, and I understand it from time to time he would point out that you you wearing a dark you wear a dark suit, but you had <laughs> no. brown socks, and he said, "Where'd you get those brown socks?" And you explained where you got those brown socks. Well, they were tan socks. Tan, this this be historically accurate. Um, okay. And I was in I was I was in a meeting uh, in the Oval Office, and I was trying to explain something, you know, and uh, I was in my usual very high class way, I was wearing a gray suit and tan socks. And uh, he, the president, you know, I, he, I was nattering away about the GDP or something, and uh, he leaned over and he pulled up my pants leg and he said, you know, Ben, he said, this is the White House. He said, we have certain standards here, <laughs> and why are you wearing tan socks with a brown or gray suit, as the case may be? And I said, Mr. President, well, I got him four for ten dollars at the Gap, <laughs> and this is a fiscally conservative administration, right, right, right. and so on. Uh, so anyway, so the, that was basically the end of that part of the meeting, and then we went on to some other things. But over, overnight, I conferred with uh, Keith Hennessy, who was the deputy uh, uh, NEC director. And the next day, uh, when the president walked into the Oval Office, every man in the room, including Vice President Cheney, was sitting like this and wearing tan, tan socks. <laughs> Okay, but you've given up tan socks for the I, time. I period. have. I can afford the black ones right. now. Okay, all right. right. Yeah. Okay. So um, after doing that for about two years, uh, obviously the president was impressed with your capabilities, and he asked you if you'd like to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve, replacing Alan Greenspan, and um, you accepted, and you were confirmed. So when you become the chairman, is it much different than being on the Federal Reserve Board, and how did you um, deal with the difference? No, it's very different. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same institution, the same issues. Uh, 
but the chair has uh, obviously leadership responsibility and, and the, the Fed is a consensus organization. The chair has to lead that consensus building. The other thing about, the thing that surprised me and it shouldn't have surprised me so much was that uh, being chair has a, has a very heavy political component to it in the sense that the chair has to confer frequently with both the executive branch and the Congress. I spent a lot of time, you know, not just testifying as Janet Yellen is today, but, uh, but meeting individually with congressmen on the phone, you know, trying to keep um, people apprised of what was happening and hearing from them what their thoughts were. So that was a, a very big difference in, in my experience. Right, so you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, a, a great job, one you probably never anticipated getting when you were teaching at Princeton or so forth. And then all of a sudden, the economy begins to go south. When did you realize we were heading into a really serious recession? Well, the recession came after the crisis. Um, so we knew, so, so one thing, I think one misconception about the crisis is that it was all about subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages, we, we saw that. We understood that at least in 2006, you know, shortly after it became chair. We talked about that in 2007, we talked about that. But, you know, the, the, the subprime mortgage crisis was important, but it was more like a trigger. It was sort of like the pebble that started the avalanche. Right. Um, so as late as, you know, spring of 2007, even though I was testifying and uh, talking about subprime mortgages, talking about foreclosures, about these concerns, about these issues, you know, we did not at that point think that the whole financial system was going to implode. Um, of course, in the summer of 07, there were a couple of hedge funds that were closed by Bear Stearns. And in August uh, of 07, uh, uh, BNP Paribas, you know, announced that it, it couldn't value its subprime securities. And beyond that point, you know, in the fall of 07, the stress in the financial markets began to get much more severe. And at that point, I think it would have been sort of the end of August 07, we, we sort of switched our, uh, switched our focus away from Thanks. worrying about inflation, which was a problem, uh, toward trying to address the, the budding right. crisis, which was just spreading out of, from the subprime right. into the whole uh, credit market. So one weekend, um, the famous weekend, I guess you're told there's a problem at AIG and a problem um, as well at Lehman Brothers. So what was that weekend like? Well, that's a year later already. This is okay. September of 08. And by this time, you know, we had been through the acquisition of Bear Stearns and all the right. controversy that that spawned. We had been through um, the takeover of Fannie and Freddie. Um, and, it, and it was clear at that point that the um, uh, financial panic was building. I mean, the, one of the things that I learned from my studying of history was that was about the, the importance of banking panics or financial panics, which was something that plagued the U.S. economy right. going way back into the, to the revolution, practically. And uh, that's, that's what was building in the U.S. Uh, creditors, uh, suppliers of funds were withdrawing. It was essentially a bank run. Um, and it was getting very bad. And by, by mid-September of, of 2008, we understood we were in a very serious situation. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, going into Lehman Weekend, that the strong prevailing opinion in the journal, in the, by journalists and the media and by economic writers and so on, was that it was time to let a company fail. You know, the Wall Street Journal said, you know, if we believe in capitalism, we have to let this company fail. Uh, Financial Times said Secretary Paulson ought to take the weekend off. You know, so it was, that was basically the mindset at that point. We'd just come from Jackson Hole, which is the annual meeting of the... Fed and other central banks in, in Wyoming, and there the very strong view had been, you know, we've we got to stop this bailout stuff, you've got to let it go. We, we didn't buy it. We really didn't buy it. We were afraid that if Lehman collapsed that, that it would make the crisis much worse. It would just create more fear, and, and we didn't know what consequences it would have. So we did try very, very hard to prevent the failure. We did, we, um, we had 12 uh, Wall Street firm, major Wall Street firms represented by their CEOs at the New York Fed, uh, and we had two potential buyers for Lehman, uh, Bank of America and Barclays. And you know the story, I basically, we, we uh, you know, there were essentially uh, three tools that we used through the, through the crisis to prevent firms from failing. One was to put capital in from TARP. That, of course, didn't come till later, so we didn't right. have the capital. Uh, second was to have the firm acquired by another firm, as we did with Bear Stearns, for example, and, but, but, you know, Bank of America basically said, there's such a big hole in the balance sheet, we can't conceivably do this right. unless you give us, you know, a gift of a lot of money. Um, the third method, which actually worked for AIG, was, uh, was making a loan against good collateral, 
and, okay. and Lehman was collapsing. It didn't really have any going value concern, and it didn't have enough collateral to, to get, you know, to justify or, or, or to uh, sustain a loan. So essentially, we didn't have any way to, to save the company, and, and uh, consequently, it failed. I think the consequences of it were, were even worse than we thought, but we were certainly aware that it was going to be very, very uh, But in hindsight, dangerous. is there anything that you could have done? I, I understand what you said, and in the books by uh, uh, Mr. Paulson and uh, Tim, Tim Geithner, they consistently say there was nothing you could do, but and now in hindsight, is there anything you think you could have done that could have saved I, I really don't think so. I mean, um, the, the ex post facto analysis of Lehman showed that it really was a bankrupt company, All right. and that... Um, Indeed, there were accounting issues, uh, repo 105 and things like that, that turned out to make the problem was even worse than we thought because it had been disguised okay. in various ways. Let me say, in a, in, a, in a broader sense, I think it was kind of inevitable in the following way, which was that after Lehman failed, that's when the government, when Congress said, okay, we gotta do, we gotta take strong action, and that's ultimately where the TARP came from and so on. I think if somehow or another, miraculously, we had saved Lehman, the next thing would have gone. Right. But so. Before we get to TARP for a yeah. moment, on AIG, that same weekend, you are able to save AIG. Any regrets about that? And now, under the law, as I understand it, um, it's now not possible to do, again, what you did with AIG. Is that right? That's right. So, no, I don't have any regrets. I think that given that Lehman had already put the system into cardiac arrest, I think AIG's collapse would have made things significantly worse. Um, although it was a very tough, it was a very tough experience, um, I remember Paulson and I going to President Bush, and you know, and Paulson had talked to pr the president and explained what was likely to happen. But we had to go to him together and say, you know, we have to lend eighty-five billion dollars to a failing insurance company in the middle of a financial crisis. How's that sound? Uh, <laughs> and to his credit, I mean, to his credit, President Bush, you know, said, you got to do what you got to do, you know, and you you do it. I'll explain it, but you you need to go talk to Congress. So. Uh, Paulson and I uh, went to uh, an ad hoc meeting of the senior members of the banking and, and finance committees from the Senate and House, the leadership. And we went over there and we had about 20 people. We were explaining you know, what, what was happening, what we thought we had to do. And we were taking questions, you know, um, you know, will it stop the crisis? We don't know. Will you get your money back? Well, we hope so. Um, and after a while, um, you know, the questions sort of petered out and and Senator Reid, you know, was, had, had his, sort of his face in his hands. And he, at this point, he, he looked at me and Paulson. And he, said, uh, he said, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Chairman, he says, I want to thank you for coming over here and explaining all this to us. It's been very helpful and for taking our questions, he said. But he said, I want you to understand one thing. Nothing you've heard here tonight constitutes congressional approval for what you're about to do. He said, this is your decision and your responsibility. And it was a very, very lonely feeling, I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, but again, I think that while, it, while it, it, right. the AIG was the gift that kept on giving, you know, we had the bonuses and all these other things that were just such terrible political disasters. Uh, but again, I do feel that uh, if we had right. not done it, that it would have been, been even worse. worse. Now, right. just to answer the other part of your question, the, uh, the, the changes that had been made to the Fed's Emergency Lending Authority, so-called 13-3 Authority, would now prohibit that. But importantly, and we supported this, that has been replaced by a more formal mechanism called the Orderly Liquidation Authority that would allow the Fed and the FDIC to put a uh, failing firm into a receivership uh, in a way that would take into account the implications to the rest of okay. the system. So I, I personally am much more comfortable with, a, with having that because then the Fed wouldn't have to take all this responsibility. Okay. It would be a much more formal and pre-approved approach, and so, no, I'm not concerned at all about the loss of that authority. So after the Lehman AIG weekend, ultimately yeah. you just, you went to Congress for TARP authority. Were you shocked when the House voted it down the first time? Well, very unhappy, not completely shocked. I mean, obviously it was very unpopular. I, uh, I talk in the book about uh, calling a senator and saying, you know, how, how your constituent calls going on this TARP right. issue. And the senator said, well, it's 50-50. He said 50% no and 50% hell no. <laughs> but uh, I, I just have to say that, you know, while TARP is still poison and, and, you know, on the campaign trail, if you voted for TARP, you know, it's a terrible thing. It's, it, it was one of the most successful programs the government's ever put in place. It, it, it stopped the crisis. It stabilized the financial system. And it made a profit. I mean, what else, you know, I mean, so 
obviously very unpopular, and I'm glad that there are now better methods for dealing with these problems, but I think it was well, In the end, how necessary. much money was put up under, under TARP uh, for... Well, the, the total amount was, was $700 billion was allocated, but I think in terms of banks, I think it was on the order of $250 billion. And how much did you get back for that? Got every penny back with, with interest profit. and profit, yeah. So when you first went up to Congress to explain to Congress before the TARP actually passed that the economy was going to collapse, what was the reaction of members of Congress when they, you said it might go into a depression? Well, it looked pretty pale, you know. <laughs> um, you know. We went and we explained, Paul Sid and I and Chris Cox, who was the head of the SEC, we explained. And I, I tried to be pretty, um, I was the one who had to explain sort of what the economic consequences might be of a complete meltdown in the financial system. And you know, I tried to draw on my history and so on. So I talked about the Depression, but I also talked about other experiences like Japan and Sweden's crisis in the 90s and so on. Um, and I think, and I, I shook them up pretty good, I think, but actually I, I, I sort of underestimated, I think, the, the impact, because the impact, of course, um, on jobs, on, on the economy was, was enormous. So after TARP was ultimately passed and was implemented and so forth, later you, at the, as the chairman of the Fed, began another program, which uh, others have called, you don't like the name, quantitative easing. And you don't like the name because it's too hard to understand? Or well, I mean, it's not or? a big deal. But, but the quantitative easing was originally done by the Bank of Japan. And it, it, in many details, which are not worth going into, it was very different from the program we had. And I wanted to emphasize that our okay. approach was a different one. And you one. prefer the name of? Credit easing, because it was about trying to loosen up the credit markets, okay. trying to get mortgage markets working again, for example. So in hindsight, you think credit easing number one worked, and credit easing number two worked, and credit easing number three worked? All were your well, I mean, I, I don't think that's a really in serious dispute. I mean, all the academic studies have found that it did affect financial conditions okay. and in turn affected um, the economy. Uh, I'm not saying it was a perfect tool. It was obviously was something that was used, used because we were essentially out of ammunition in terms of interest rate cuts. But looking broadly around the world, you see that uh, the two countries that did the best in terms of recovery were the U.S. and the U.K., right. which are the two countries who used this tool early on. And other countries like Japan and, and Europe have subsequently you know, followed. Let's talk about the economy today. Um, what do you think the economy's status is today? Are you worried about a recession? Or are you worried about deflation? What is your greatest concern? Well, we have a very interesting situation, which is in some ways analogous to where we were in the 90s, which is that the domestic US economy looks to be in pretty good shape. Uh, it's being driven by a fairly strong household sector. You know, people, jobs have come back. You know, wages are beginning to rise. Um, Debts have been paid down, you know, markets are stronger, uh, certainly compared to a few years ago. Um, so you have uh, strengthening consumer spending, you have the housing sector, of course, has been relatively weak in the recovery, but is continuing to improve. Uh, so overall, you have a domestic U.S. economy, which has got some momentum, has been moving forward, creating jobs. Um, there's the issue of very slow productivity growth, which is a somewhat separate issue, but in terms of the cyclical recovery, you're seeing uh, a, a good dynamic, but, but the risk and the threat, of course, is mostly coming externally. Uh, we have a, a slowing Chinese economy, and that, in turn, the combination of slower China, weak commodity prices, strong dollars affecting emerging markets around the world, which in turn is creating stress in financial markets. And so all this, you know, the strong dollar, the weak export markets, and the financial stress is feeding back on our economy and, and is becoming a significant headwind. And so they're you know, that is, that's, what, uh, that's the battle in some sense that's going on now. Are you worried about deflation and very low growth in Europe now? Well, uh, Europe is in, you know, has come, moved from into a, a better policy situation. I mean, I do think that it, it took them many years, but they have, the European Central Bank has adopted some of the unconventional policies that the Fed pioneered six years earlier. And on the fiscal side, you know, the Fiscal policy was very, very tight in Europe, much tighter even than the United States because of the austerity and so on that they were running. And that austerity period seems to be over and budgets are more neutral now in Europe. So between less resistance right. from fiscal policy and a better, more supportive monetary policy, you expect to see a little bit more growth. They are, however, also facing the international concerns that we have in the United States. And if anything, uh, their exporters are even more exposed to emerging markets than, than we are. So what about China? Are you comfortable with that the numbers that the Chinese government publishes as their official numbers are accurate? And are you worried about the Chinese economy's growth rate? 
Well, the numbers, uh, you know, they think they've gotten better. Um, Chairman Greenspan used to laugh that they put out their quarterly GDP figures on the last day of the quarter. You know, they didn't actually have to wait and, you know, collect anything. Um, the data have gotten somewhat better, but, uh, you know, what's, what's happening there uh, is that they're trying, as we, the United States, have urged them to, they're trying to make a transition to change their growth model. For a long time, their growth model was a very centrist, top-down, kind of model focused on heavy industry, exports, construction, um, and they were trying to move from that to a more services, consumer-oriented type economy, which uh, is difficult to do. I think they're making progress. It was predictable, so in some sense, the slowing that we're seeing there was something that we all expected to happen. Maybe the timing is a little bit different, but we expected to see that happen. Um, but that's the challenge you're going through. And of course, the services side of the economy is even harder to measure probably than the heavy industry side. So there's a lot of, I think one of the big problems is that uh, between the fact that their policymakers are not always so transparent about what their objectives and, and intentions are, and the fact that the data and, and other information is, is not at the standard we would see in the United States, that uh, a lot of the concerns that are rising are just because people are very uncertain about what exactly is happening there. We know that the, the outward facing part of China, the heavy industry commodity using uh, exporting sector is, is declining, uh, but to some extent that's part of the plan. They, they want to re reduce their reliance on that sector and move to a, a more modern services oriented so, sector. So let me ask you about, the, in the US, I realize you're not going to comment on your successor and what the Fed's doing. Uh, no chairman really does that uh, once he leaves. But if you were to be a betting person, would you bet that interest rates might go up at some point this year, or you wouldn't? You wouldn't be a betting person. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't make bets. Um, they've, they've, they've made pretty clear what their scenario is. Their scenario is one in which the uh, labor market continues to improve. As the labor market improves, um, that should put pressure on wages and prices and begin to create motion of inflation towards 2%. And if that is the scenario that in fact transpires, then they'll have to, at some point, you know, tighten policy to, to keep okay. things, to keep inflation near its target. Of course, they don't know any more than anyone else does, you know, what the effect is gonna be of the global slowing and the financial stress that we're seeing. And to the extent that throws things off course, obviously they'll have to adjust to that. So do you foresee a situation in the United States ever where we have a negative interest rate? So in other words, as a way to kind of, uh, other, other governments are, are implementing a policy where essentially uh, you pay to have a bank take your money. Do mm -hmm. you see that possibility here? Well, it's a possibility that, that you know, of course we didn't do, we didn't do in, in the recovery. Uh, it's a possibility that a few members of the Fed have talked about it a little bit. So it's certainly something that might be down the road, right. possibly. I, I don't think it's very likely. I mean, one of the issues is that um, a negative interest rate would have unanticipated consequences on the functioning of money markets, right. you know, and, and perhaps make it difficult for um, those markets to, to operate normally. So there'd be a lot of technical issues to be addressed before that happened. Anyway, I don't right. think that's a, a near term. Okay. Um, you were very uh, well known for transparency at the Fed compared to some of your predecessors. You had press conferences and, and so forth. Um, but you didn't think that the Fed should be so transparent as to be audited. You can consider that different because auditing, it'd be more interference with what the Fed does as opposed to transparency. Is that your thinking? So audit the Fed has nothing to do with auditing. So auditing, everyone here thinks of auditing as, um, you know, going over the books, right? Looking at all the financial uh, statements. And the Fed already does that completely. I mean, there's an outside private sector auditing firm that goes over all the books. All of the securities that the Fed holds are on the website. You can look up right. to the QCIP number, everything the Fed owns. Um, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, which is the, arm, the investigative arm of Congress, has the authority to go in and look at basically anything okay. it wants to, and it has. It's looked at the, all, the, all the crisis era programs, it's looked at everything, and basically given the Fed a clean bill of health. So what does auditing the Fed have to do? What auditing the Fed would do is that currently in the law, there is one area where, um, the GAO is not allowed to do an audit, do a, a review, and that is in monetary policy decision making. Okay, so what is at stake here is whether or not Congress could ask the GAO to review the December policy decision 
and, right. you know, and, and look through, get the papers, get the documents, and, and basically investigate whether or not the Fed should have raised interest rates in December. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. And I guess the way I would put it slightly, in a slightly um, uh, jocular way would be, if you like the way Congress is running fiscal policy, why not put them in charge of monetary policy? Because <laughs> uh, that's what it would amount to. I really okay. think that this would be, that would be a bad, it would be a really bad intervention of okay. political considerations into what's supposed to be a technical, Okay. Uh, nonpartisan objective policy-making decision. Now, the Fed minutes of the FOMC meetings are released five years after um, mm -hmm. the meetings occur, and uh, just recently the meetings uh, minutes have been released, and they reveal that when you were considering uh, things like uh, quantitative easing and other things, there was a big dis uh, discussion among members of the Fed, and some were very much against it, though they went along with your policy. Do you have any comments on uh, the releasing of uh, these things after five years? you think it should be sooner than five years? you think it's a good idea to release them at all? Well, there's a trade-off, which is, um, you know, releasing those materials, including every comment that everybody makes, um, does inhibit the discussion at the meeting some, because, you know, it used to be, um, it used to be that, um, there were, that the FOMC meetings were pretty much free-floating, you know, free-form discussions about every issue that could come up, and since the transcripts started being released in the mid-90s, people come with a written statement and they read their statement. So the, 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 the discussion has been inhibited by that. That being said, I understand the desire for transparency and I think five years is probably long enough that it, uh, it doesn't really interfere with current policy making. So I, I, I don't object to the current situation, but I, 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 there is a trade-off there. There is some cost to, to doing it that way. And I would just note that no other central bank in the world does it. Okay, and your press conference, you used to hold press conferences. That, um, the Fed never did, the Fed chairman never did that before. You mm -hmm. think that's a good policy and should be continued? Yes, absolutely. I, um, I came to the Fed, I mean, one of the few things, you know, the, you know, life hands you all different kinds of surprises, obviously, me and more than most people. Uh, but when I came to the Fed in, in 2002 as a governor, the main thing I wanted to do was to try and increase the Fed's transparency, make the Fed more open about its goals, its policies, explain what it was doing, why it was doing that. That's why I wanted, for example, an inflation target, the 2% target that the Fed has. Um, and so we did a lot of things along those lines. I think the press conferences are one of the more right. successful ones, and it's an opportunity for the, for the chair to explain right. what the committee's thinking and to take questions from the media. And, you know, it's a, I think it's a good step towards openness. Um, you said earlier the Fed has seven members. But for a while, it's only had five members because uh, the Congress doesn't, the Senate doesn't seem to want to approve any more members. Can the Fed operate very long for just five members? Well, we, we operated with five members, I mean, through a very difficult period. We operated with five members from basically my entire chairmanship throughout the crisis. Um, so it can be done, but it, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that there seems to be uh, a habit now that in the last year and a half or two years of the president's right. term, he can't get anybody through approved for, um, you know, for the Fed board, and that that does leave the Fed shorthanded because the Fed, besides making monetary policy, has many other responsibilities in in uh, regulation and supervision and and other areas. And if you're going to hold the Fed responsible for doing these things well, you need to make sure they have the people in place to make those decisions. And when you're chairman of the Fed, uh, it'd be very embarrassing if the chairman of the Fed had a policy that he couldn't get the rest of the Fed to go along with. So do you kind of talk to people in advance and say, this is what I would like you to do? Or do you just kind of say, here's what I want, and they fall in line? No, you have to, I mean, Janet apparently calls pretty much everybody on the committee. I used to call, you know, not everybody necessarily, but I made a lot of phone calls, a lot of discussions on the hallway where the other board members are. Um, the Fed is a consensus organization. The idea long-standing ideas that the chairman tries to bring along the whole committee or as many people as possible to create um, a, a, a central plan that, that, that everybody, you know, right. or most people can support. Um, in doing so, uh, there's a lot of consultation and, and uh, people, uh, of course, individual members who are influential and can, and can make a good argument, you know, eventually begin to bring people over to their side and it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of, uh, of, of inertia, but over time, you know, uh, influential members of the committee can okay. shift the consensus. Well, did you ever call up a vote for something and you didn't know what the outcome was going to be before you started? No, no. no didn't do that. Okay. <laughs> and you're pre you're pointing out in your book that um, I, I just say it's a good idea not to do that, but. Uh, and you point out in your book that your predecessor would start every meeting at 
the Federal Reserve by saying, here is what his view was. You used to wait until the end of the meeting to comment. What's the reason for that? Well, no, there were two rounds. The first round was the, the lengthier round where um, everybody sort of gave their view of what's happening in the economy. Right. That was called the economic go round. And the second round was called the policy go round where you went around and asked, everybody right. gave their opinion of what we should do today. Um, and th the way Greenspan ran it was that there would be the economic go round. Everybody would talk about how they saw the economy, what was happening. Then in the policy go around, the second round, Greenspan would speak first and say, I think that right. you know, we should do this. And the rest of the go round was more or less people reacting to his initial discussion. So I, I kind of thought, little did I know, but I kind of thought that that was sort of cutting off the discussion by too much. And I wanted to foster a more collegial, interactive kind of discussion. And so what I would do is I would have that second go around. And then I would, at the end, I would say, here's what I heard. And then I would you know, talk about what I thought we should do. Um, I don't know how different it really was in terms of the actual outcomes, but it gave everybody a more chance to lay out their views and, and to have a good discussion. So any regrets about not seeking to stay longer as chairman of the Fed, or were you happy you left when you left? Um, no, I, 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 I was clear. I told the president that you know, I don't know what would have happened, but I told the president that I wasn't interested in staying any longer, that uh, eight years was plenty for okay. me. and. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm glad now to be a civilian again. And if you look back on your term as the Fed, is there anything you wish you had done differently? <laughs> uh, not taking the job, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> okay. But uh, generally, you're pretty happy with what happened, or? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, it, it, some very terrible things happened, you know, the, the crisis and the recession, and you always have to ask yourself, you know, what could have been done to avoid it? I don't. I, you know, I, I have difficulty identifying any obvious action, but um, I hope at least that we can say that we've learned a lot from what's happened and that we will make the system stronger and avoid such crises in the future. Now, you point out um, in something you've said that your mother uh, uh, pointed out when you left the Fed, you were 60 years old, and your mother was concerned you hadn't driven in eight years and mm -hmm. that you might not be able to drive a car again. Um, has that Concern been you can valid? see her level of interest is sort of constant right. over right. time. Right. You know, right. it's always right. very mundane issues. But now you drive your own car. I drive my own car. I drove uh, from home to Brookings the first day after I was out of office, and so far so good. When you're out shopping or things like that, people don't bother you. Ask for your economic advice or where interest rates no, are going. Nobody no, once does. in a while people say hello, but uh, I'm happy to uh, again not to have all the all the paraphernalia. So now that you're at Brookings, and as the co-chairman of Brookings, we're obviously honored to have you there, and hope you'll stay there for a long time, but do you have any career plans you'd like to reveal to the Economic Club of Washington? Uh, <laughs> only my therapist. No, um, no, I'm, I'm very happy being at, at Brookings. It's a great home base for me. I'm doing a variety of different things. Of course, I finished the book and did a book tour uh, in October, November. Um, very pleased with that, and it's had a good reception. I've written some papers. I have a whole series of lectures I got planned for the spring at different universities, including Duke, we were talking right. about. Um, so I have a lot on my plate, and I'm happy to, to do that. And your children have decided not to go into economics, is that correct? Yeah, I think there's some cause and effect there. Right? Okay, uh, all right. Yeah, they're, they're both in, in medical areas. So on behalf of the country, I want to thank you for a great job you did as chairman of the Fed. It was very helpful to get our country through that very difficult time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for a great job. Thank you.